Hello, friends. This is Dave Hurwitz, executive editor at ClassicsToday.com, here with part three of our initial series of how to listen to great music, taking as our exemplar of the great music in question, Edvard Grieg's Peer Gint Suite Number no. 1, which I've described pretty well in previous videos, I think. So you can go and watch those if you haven't, because you really need to be taking this in cumulatively. There's like jewels of information in each separate video. And in this video, we're going to be talking about the first number in the Peer Gint Suite Number no. 1, which has four pieces in it. There are four bits. And I'm not doing them in order. I'm doing them in whatever order occurs to me because I think it doesn't really matter at this point. I just want to get a sense of, or want you to get a sense of all of the marvelous variety that's packed into this little, little bunch of movements. They're called movements, by the way, not songs, not other things. Classical pieces that aren't actual songs are not called songs. They're called works pieces, movements, concertos, symphonies, operas, oratorios, whatever they're called is what they're called. And as you get to know your great music, you'll get to know what it's called. So the Piergen Suite is a suite, meaning a collection, a selection of pieces from some larger work, the larger work in question being the complete series of incidental music that Grieg wrote for the play Pierre Gint by Henrik Ibsen and the complete work, the whole shebangy, even with most of the play taken out, is about, about 90 minutes long. It's a big, big, big piece because it's a very long play where lots of stuff happens. It's basically a film score, as I've said before. And Morning, the morning mood, actually technical, technically it's called Morgenstimmung or something like that in German or Norwegian. It's, 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 it's the morning feeling, the morning mood, the morning wake up. And that piece is the prelude to act four of the play. Now, everybody knows this piece, just about. I mean, most people have heard it. It is essential for television commercials, particularly for things involving vegetables, like salad dressing. I mean, there, was a, there, was, there were a couple of years where you could not find salad dressing that was not advertised with this piece behind it, that was not advertised with this piece behind it, pardon me. Everybody used it, and they still do. It's used in cartoons. You're probably familiar with it. It has become the iconic representation of morning or the outdoors or a peaceful, tranquil, sort of rustic, countryside scene. Interestingly enough, in the movie, in the movie, in the play, <laughs> I didn't have movies back in 1876 when Grieg wrote this, in the play, it represents morning in the Sahara Desert of all places. People tend to think that because Grieg was Norwegian, this is, you know, the sun coming over the fjords. <laughs> in Bergen, Norway, which is where Grieg was originally from. But no, it's not. It's Dawn on the Sahara. And that's in itself, that little error that people often make in, in associating it with Norway just goes to show what wordless music can and can't do. It is fabulous. I mean, nothing is better. It's suggesting the mood of morning, that time of day, but the location of that time of day, well, music doesn't do that as well. It can't get into the specifics. And unless there are words telling you, this is dawn over the Sahara, then you're not going to know. You're just going to get morning. And Grieg didn't call it morning in the Sahara. He called it the morning mood. Now, each of these talks has focused on some aspect, some quintessential aspect of music, what music is, what it does, what it says to us, what the, its possibilities are. And I, I, I am very, very excited actually to get to this particular, this particular piece because it actually involves two, two subjects that I want to bring up. Two of them, they both begin with T, topics and timbre. Topics is, I think, one of the more 
fascinating and historically fascinating of all of the things we could discuss in relation to, to music, because music does not exist in a vacuum. When we talk about great music here, classical music, we're talking about the Western tradition. And that tradition is thousands of years old, and it has certain recurring themes or ideas and ways of expressing them. And you do not get those so much when you listen to pop songs or popular music because that's a very, very limited sample of this enormously long history of music. But when you start listening to other things in other media, you begin, you begin to get a sense that you're part of this endless chain of being. And it really is just an absolutely marvelous thing to get to know. It's one of the fabulous benefits of getting to know great music, is understanding what some of its most famous recurring topics are about. Now, the word topic is, is actually a, a term of art. It, it's the English version of the Greek word topos, the plural is topoi. It used to be everyone called them topoi or topos, and they still do sometimes in like the academic literature. But the English translation is topic or topics, and it means what it, exactly what the word means. The topic in this case is pastoral music. That is music evocative of the outdoors, the countryside. And that topic goes so far back, I, nobody even knows where it begins. But I want to play the Greek. We're going to listen to the whole thing. Then we're going to talk about what some of the elements are that make up this topic. And then I'm going to play you some other examples by other composers of things that make up this topic. So you can hear, hear the commonality in all of it. And it's, oh, trust me, this is going to be so much fun. It's an absolutely wonderful, wonderful thing. Because what it means is that you can go back and understand hundreds of years of music by its shared employment of certain musical techniques to embody the particular topic of pastoral or countryside or outdoors or sunrise or any of these natural phenomena. It's just, it's just a marvelous, marvelous thing. And this is one of the things that you pick up when you just pay attention, when you listen. The only way to do it, as I've said a million times, is by listening and listening and more listening. But I can speed the process up a little bit. And that's the whole point of these talks. So let's listen to the gorgeous, gorgeous morning mood from Pierre Gint with the Malmo Symphony Orchestra conducted by by uh, Bengt Engeset, or Biarte, Bengt, Bengt, I'm sorry, Biarte Engeset on Nexus. Here it is, morning from Pier Gint.
have you finished your salad? I had it for lunch, so I was all prepared. But I mean, can you think of a piece of music that is more evocative of of morning? Well, morning, well, being outdoors in a countryside landscape, it's, it's, it's amazing. What are the things that make it outdoorsy sounding? And this is a very tricky question because there are some things that make it outdoorsy sounding because of the sounds of the instruments and some things that, that do that because of the way they've been used over the past thousands of years. And some of you who are familiar with this kind of music will understand that. And those of you who have not listened to enough may not get it yet. But trust me when I tell you it's there. The first thing is the use of woodwinds, woodwind instruments, flutes, oboes, clarinets, horns in the distance, all of those sounds that suggest an outdoor feel. And woodwinds are absolutely the, the outdoor instruments because, they, I mean, first of all, they were, they were sort of built to be played outdoors historically. You know, wind serenades and woodwind ensembles and band music and all those things. It's outdoor music. It wasn't made to be kept in a room somewhere. That's number one. Number two is that the instruments themselves are actually, are actually stylized versions of reeds, pipes, you know, the, the earliest instruments we have, the things that, you know, shepherds would put together and tootle along to like, you know, visit their sheep. I'm not quite sure why shepherds did that, but they did, apparently. Actually, I have a, a very funny story about that. I mean, uh, my, my mother was with a couple of her friends and one of them, they were talking about what their children were doing. And one of them said that her son had become a poet. And my mother's friend looked at her and said, well, look at the bright side. At least he's not a shepherd. There you go. You see, that's how out of style shepherdizing is. But the music, the music of shepherds was, of course, flute music. And so when you hear at the very beginning of morning, that flute going, I mean, you're like, oh, wow. And we know it. We just know it. We know it from, from the environment, from where we've seen it on commercials, from salad dressing, from cartoons, from movies, from all of these things. We, we instinctively associate that. So there's something primal going on here. I mean, partly it's a result of the media, but partly it's a result of, of us, of who we are and what we've done and where we've come from. And this music evokes that woodwind timbres are incredibly important in conveying that sense of being outside or outdoors. There are also certain harmonic elements that we're going to get to as well. The other thing that I want to talk about is, is the meter, the rhythm of this particular piece. It's in what they call 6-8 time, which is not very complicated. What it means is that you have an eighth note for each beat and six of them in every bar. Now, 6-8 time is what they call compound meter because it can divide into a rhythm of two or a rhythm of three. When it divides into a rhythm of two, it's one, two, three, two, two, three, one, two, three, two, 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 two one, two, three, two, two, three. Get it? So there's two big beats in every bar and three notes in every beat. But it can also go into two. It can be one, two, three, four, five, six, one, two, three. And there are some pieces of music that do both in six, eight meter. One of the most famous is Leonard Bernstein's song, America, from West Side Story, which is get it? One, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two. So compound meters tend to be very flowing. They're because, because of this ability to be in either two or three, even when they don't do it all the time, there's this fluidity to the music and this feeling of, of sort of, I mean, I, I don't know how else to describe it, this pastoral concept, <laughs> this feeling of nature, this, this, this kind of, I don't know, it's, it's, it's a function of the rhythm. It's almost impossible to define, but it's, it's, it's separate, as I said, between what it is innately and how it's been used historically. But pastoral music tends to use this kind of rhythm 
quite frequently. And if it, if it doesn't, it, it pretends to. It's something we don't have to get into particularly. But it's fascinating that way, that, that you always find this, this, this sort of um, duality in pastoral music between double and triple meter to keep the rhythm flowing, to make sure it doesn't sound rigid or mechanical. That's the point. It's really just a marvelous thing, a fascinating little subtle touch. And Grieg, of course, is working in that tradition when he writes this piece called Morning Mood. Now, I want to do a little bit of comparisons so you can just get a sense of this, this vast tradition we have of pastoral music and how it all features these things, usually, usually triplet rhythms, that is rhythms of three and two, and woodwind solos, and also what you might call, well, what we do call drone basses. A drone bass is what a bagpipe does. You know, bagpipes, you know, they go, you know, that, that's a drone. That's simply a note that is persistent, that repeats throughout the whole melody or large bits of it. And drones are some of the most primitive accompaniments in human, human imagining because the idea of bagpipes or piping with a drone is like, it's like a bazillion years old. I mean, it goes back before the Middle Ages. It's one of those very, very ancient sounds. And that ancient sound, that sound of, of antiquity is also an element that Grieg exploits right at the beginning of morning when you hear the flute and you hear those woodwinds sustain that with the tune on top. It's a static accompaniment. That's what makes the music sound so sort of lazy and carefree and not in any rush to get anything done. So you hear those as well quite often in pastoral music. And here is a classic example. I have it sitting right here, one of the most famous of all examples. It comes from Handel's Messiah. It's the Pifa. It's called a Pifa. A pifa or the pastoral symphony. Now, in this case, symphony does not mean what it means in like Beethoven's day. It means simply, simply a orchestral piece, an instrumental piece, really of any type. That's an introduction to something else. But in this case, it represents, you know, the scene of the baby Jesus in the manger. You know, animals, sheep. You got to have sheep, with the sheep running around. And Handel is only using strings, so he's not going to have the opportunity to use flutes and oboes and all these other things that popped up later. Although Handel did have them, he doesn't use them here. But what he does use is the drone, the bagpipe drone, and a tune that sounds like a genuine shepherd's tune. And whether or not it's played on the strings or not, the character of the melody comes over to us quite well. And of course, it's written in that wonderfully fluid kind of meter that rhythm that we all think about when we hear pastoral music. So let's listen to a, just a bit of the Pifa from Handel's Messiah. This is an early example, or actually, I mean, in terms of history, it's probably somewhere in the middle. <laughs> but for our purposes, that is of wordless instrumental music, this is an early example of, of the pastoral topic, topos, topic. Here it is. That was the Academy of Ancient Music under Edward Higginbottom on Naxos. So you, you heard the, the countryfied sort of ambience there, didn't you? It's something that, that we all respond to almost instinctively. 
Um, I really am very curious. I, I don't know. Maybe someone in the psychology of music can tell us whether whether our response is acquired or whether it's just something that's innate that we we just know when we hear it. Next up, I'm going to play you a wonderful, wonderful example. I mean, this is one of my all-time favorite examples because it has everything. It has it has flutes and oboes. It has bagpipe drones in it. It has that that sort of flowing rhythm, even though it's not actually in 6-8 time, but it, it has the same sort of fluidity because it cuts across the meter the way it's written. So it pretends to be in that sort of 6-8 time. This is the middle section called a trio, even though it has nothing to do with the number three. It's the middle section of the third movement, which is a minuet from Haydn's Symphony Number no. 88. This is one of the most fabulous little tone poems in all of music. It tells you immediately where you are, outside, in the country, listening to a bagpiper, possibly. Uh, it's, it's just amazing. Here's Barry Wordsworth with the Capella Istropolitana on Naxos. And boy, I mean, Grieg is not far away from this. I think you'll agree when you hear it. It's so rural. <laughs> it is in the country. There's nothing urban about it. And you'll also notice it's not, it's not trying to be passionate, emotional at all. It's trying to be still, tranquil, and it's, it's very calming music. It's incredibly beautiful. Then the classic pastoral symphony is Beethoven's, the pastoral symphony, his symphony number no. six, which begins with you know, a drone, believe it or not. Yes, a drone. And then you'll hear the oboes pick up the principal tune and everybody comes in and you know, once again, you're in the country. And not only do we know where we're in the country musically, Beethoven says that the music represents happy feelings on arrival in the country. So that's what this music is supposed to represent. The mood, not the place. We don't know which country we're happy <laughs> to be in. It's just the mood. And here's Paul Kletsky with the Czech Philharmonic doing just the opening of Beethoven's Pastoral Symphony, a whole symphony about being in the country. Absolutely 
I mean, we, we know it. We know it from the movie Fantasia. We know it from, you know, a hundred million other places. I mean, could there be any other, any other more graphic indication that we're listening to pastoral music? And finally, I want to get a little closer to Grieg because Grieg was 1876 and we could do, we could keep going. We could keep going on this topic until yesterday if we wanted to. It's very much alive. This is not dead music. This is an ongoing discourse on a universal topic, a universal theme that composer after composer after composer has tried to embody in music. But the great pastoral composer in the 19th century after Beethoven was Dvorak. No question about it. In fact, he wrote three pastoral symphonies. He didn't call them that, but you might as well. I mean, you really could. They're, they're numbers, numbers two, five, and eight, basically. And they are extraordinarily lovely. And here is the opening of his fifth symphony, an amazing piece of music, which again tells us unquestionably that this is where we are. Yeah, get it? And one of the things that pastoral music has, which this certainly, certainly does, and the Beethoven and the Grieg, is that the harmony, it, remember we talked about harmony in the last talk on the third number in the Pyrrhic Suite, Ozzy's Death, where the harmony is very sophisticated, actually, because it's constantly changing. Well, here, it doesn't. It's very simple harmony. It's based on the the essential steps in a major chord, da, 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 you know, I mean, it, it, it's try, I don't know if that was a major chord, but, you know, the harmony itself doesn't move around very much. It tends to be very stable, somewhat placid, and very euphonious. It sounds very mellow and very, very attractive. There's nothing in there aside from maybe a little spice to perk it up a little bit and keep it from getting boring. But basically, the kinds of chords that the composers choose are normal, simple chords, not sophisticated, dissonant, modern-y sounding chords or anguished, bitter, scary, minor key chords. Nothing like that. The music is 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 always seeking to be calm, calm and mellow and euphonious. That's the word, euphonious. And we could go on. I mean, you could listen to Vaughan Williams, who wrote a pastoral symphony in the 1920s. I mean, this, this topic goes on and on and on with marvelous, marvelous masterpieces. And one of the things that is so great about getting to know great music is once you understand that you're you're plugged into a topic, if you like that topic, you can go and listen to thousands of pieces of music that are all that are all evocative of that same topic and you have your way in. You have a doorway. You can like some or dislike some, but you will understand them immediately and you'll hear the commonality. And that's one of the things I'd like to sort of get to in this series of discussions. And we'll, we'll, we'll get to other topics as well. We will, I promise you that. But I wanted you to hear those just so you get a sense of where this can go, what the potential is. There's just a universe out there that you have the tools to explore. 
And that's what's so great about it. I mean, I didn't take a course in topics in classical music. I just started listening. And I noticed that some things sound like other things. And then when I looked at what those other things were, I was able to formulate a sense of what was going on. And then, and then you'll be able to hear pieces that are completely unfamiliar, totally unfamiliar, but you'll go, ah, I know what that is. That's the pastoral topic. And uh, that it's just, it's a, a wonderful feeling to have that kind of, that kind of relationship to the music. So that's the first subject we're discussing in this talk. Now, the second one, the other T word, is timbre. And it's related to the pastoral topic because, as I said, the pastoral topic employs woodwind sonority more than anything else. The timbre of the actual instruments is so extraordinarily important in creating the topic. But there's a lot of pastoral music, which is not written for full orchestra. It could be written for solo piano. It could be written for any number of things. It could be a choral piece, for all we know. And so there also has to be something that's inherent in the music that allows the composer to get the job done, to evoke what he wants the music to evoke. And it just so happens, believe it or not, that Grieg himself wrote a version of this movement, actually the whole Pierkin first suite, for solo piano, just a solo piano. Now, all of that orchestral color is gone when you play it on a piano. And there's something that I really need to warn you all about. This is a one of the sort of like danger zones in the world of classical music. It is an extremely common occurrence to hear people tell you that orchestral music or music that is extremely splashy or vivid in its coloring is somehow cheap or second rate because using color is a somehow, you know, it, it, it's, it's, it's a, it's a, it's slumming. It's lazy. It's using effects to do things that music ought to do. These are people who think, and believe me, there are a lot of them out there. For example, that Beethoven's late string quartets must be greater than his symphonies because there's less because it's only four strings, and because four strings are more monochrome than a big, glorious orchestra, that the music somehow has to be more profound and deeper and, and, and you know, somehow more sublime because it denies itself things. That is one of the most damaging and horrible <laughs> points of view that I, I, I can't even... It makes me angry to think about it. I, I don't want to go on a rant about it. But what I do want to point out is this. The only reason people feel that way is, first of all, because they define their whole lives in terms of what they aren't, in terms of negativity. Yes, the late Beethoven string quartets are sublime and fabulous, but so is the Mrs. Solemnus. <laughs> so is a lot of others. There were a lot of other pieces. And people who choose to express themselves in a certain medium, all that matters is how they're successful, how successful they are at getting the job done. The medium itself is not better or worse than any other medium. And for certain topics, having a big orchestra on hand is a really handy thing to have. It does make your job easier. But that doesn't mean the music is less sublime or profound or anything else. It doesn't. It absolutely doesn't. Do not listen to those people. They think, you know, there are people, I, I've met people who actually take the position that music is best not even listened to that you should simply be able to read a score and hear it in your head and just imagine what it is. I mean, they would probably be happiest if music didn't exist at all because that would be the ideal music, the music of total negation of everything, <laughs> including itself. I mean, that's how crazy sometimes this gets. But, but don't go there. Do not subscribe to this puritanical nonsense that holds that that the less you have, the better the music must be. This is a particular problem in the German instrumental tradition, I must say, the German symphonic tradition. And it, the reasons why it is that way, we don't have to get into, but it's there. So I'm telling you, stay away, stay away, back, 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 you know, get behind me, Satan, you know, just... Mm. So I wanted to make that point. 
because I think it's really, really interesting to consider what timbre does. One of the reasons that timbre is sort of disregarded is, is because it's like melody and harmony, although you can describe it in excruciating detail. No one knows why it, it has the effect it does on us. You can't break it down. You know, just notes on a page, that you can break down. <laughs> That's all they are is notes on a page. It's what happens when they sound that uh, people have a hard time performing an analysis. And Grieg's Morning Mood is one of those, those indescribable pieces that is absolutely specific as to what it's supposed to do. But there's no way <laughs> to describe why it is that way. Anyway, I want you to hear now the piano version of exactly the same music with all of that luscious orchestral color, the flutes, the oboes, the distant horns, all that, the, the little gorgeous singing cellos, all of that stuff gone. And all you have is a guy at a keyboard, wonk it away. And it's rather amazing how much of the music, I think, comes over nonetheless. But Grieg's own setting is very, very cleverly designed to find other ways of achieving the same effect. So here we have the complete Grieg piano music with Einar Stein Nuckelberg, fantastic Norwegian pianist, on Nexus, 14 discs of the complete Grieg piano music. He wrote a lot. And here is Morning on the Piano.
Isn't that remarkable? What does Grieg do to give us that same sense of, of calm, of being outside somewhere, of, of maybe some sort of, some sort of primeval or primal sense? Well, the first thing he does, and I think that it's really just uh, amazing, and of course, Nickelberg is, is quite, quite tuned into this aspect of it, is that he, what he does is he arpeggiates all the chords. In other words, the opening of it, remember, is just the woodwinds going, mm, we're going to hear it again. Don't worry. You can confirm this for yourself. It's just a simple drone. Remember the drone? And then the flute comes in with the tune over the top. But here, the piano can't sustain a melody the way an orchestra can, although it sustains fairly well. Um, so instead, it strums. It strums the chords, and that's called arpeggiating. In other words, you, you play a chord one note after the other. So instead of having thong and once, you just go like that. It sounds rather like a harp. That's my guess anyway. It has a certain, what you might call a bardic quality, as though an old minstrel from, you know, the, 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 some sort of mythological time was sitting there telling you a story about, about the mysteries of the past one morning and he's strumming on his harp and singing some sort of mythological tale to you. That's what you can do very, very well on the piano. Piano is marvelous at that kind of music and Grieg totally knows it, absolutely knows it. And so that's one way he gets around the fact that he doesn't have all these separate colors and things that automatically just go straight through to your brain. He has to rewrite the music and reimagine it as though it never existed for orchestra. The wonderful thing about this setting is that you can listen to it all by itself, for itself. It still sounds wonderfully pastoral, but you know, if the orchestra version didn't exist, we would still know what it is. We might not know it's the Sahara Desert, we might not say morning mood, but we would say it's pastoral music because of the rhythm, because of the meter, because of the use of very simple harmony, and because of that additional quality that the piano has that he doesn't take advantage of in the orchestra. So you see, it's, it's always a recipe when you're composing great music, because great music has everything. It has melody, it has harmony, it has rhythm, it has timbre, it has, you know, it has all the qualities that music has, it has. What matters, as I said in previous talks, is the recipe. How do you emphasize certain elements over other elements? What do you do to give prominence to those ideas or those musical qualities which make the piece maximally expressive according to the composer's intentions. And I think this is just a wonderful example of it because you get the wonderful, wonderful history of the topic of pastoral music. And we also have the opportunity to hear how the music itself embodies the topic irrespective of its setting, whether it's for orchestra or whether it's for solo piano, and how Grieg was able to make sure that he, he gets his message across no matter what's playing it. And uh, I, I, I just find this so incredibly interesting. I hope you do too. I really do. It's so, it's so amazing. And we're going to play Morning one more time before we, to wrap things up, we're gonna to listen to it one more time because we've talked about a lot of other music, we've heard different versions, and now I wanna bring you back to the original that we heard way at the beginning of this talk. And, and with all that we have just learned in mind, let's listen to it all over again and see if it doesn't give you a certain additional, additional uh, enthusiasm, let's say. Here it is.
Morning from the Peergen Suite Number 1 by Edvard Grieg, one of the great examples in all of music of the pastoral topic and the use of instrumental timbre, both keyboard and orchestral, in order to achieve it. And, oh my God, what a wonderful piece. And when you think about it, I mean, I've known this piece now for, what, 50 some odd plus years? I mean, ever since I was, you know, in my single digits. And it never, it never gets boring. It never sounds tired. It never loses its freshness. That's what makes it great. A great example of what it is. Something to keep in mind as you pursue your own listening. So keep on listening, friends. Thank you so much for joining me. Only one more movement to go, and then we'll have the big wrap-up. Take care.